And with that, I think we can go ahead and get things started. So we're very fortunate to have a wonderful panel of presenters with us today. That includes Paula Spivak, President and CEO of Volunteer Canada, Ruth Millard, President of Volunteer Management Professionals of Canada, and we also have a very special guest with us today, the Honourable Ratna Omidvar, Independent Senator for Ontario and the Deputy Chair of the Special Senate Committee on the Charitable Sector. So I think I'm going to pass things over to Paula first to get us started. Welcome, Paula. Thank you, and uh, welcome to you all. Um, on behalf of Volunteer Canada, we want to say how pleased we are to be working with Charity Village and our colleagues with the Volunteer Pro Management Professionals of Canada. We want to start by congratulating the members of the Special Senate Committee on the Charitable Sector for their exceptional work in exploring a multitude of issues synthesizing a vast array of information, listening carefully to leaders and practitioners from all sectors and regions, and articulating in such a clear way recommendations. The perseverance of the senators and their staff team over many years to even establish the committee was really tremendous. The report is important because it has the potential to raise the profile and the credibility of our sector and set a clear path to modernizing the regulatory framework, enhancing cross-jurisdictional collaboration, and really improving multi-sector engagement. At Volunteer Canada, we have the privilege and joy of seeing how volunteers, charitable and not-for-profit organizations are ever more engaged in addressing critical social, economic and environmental issues. And along with more than 200 local volunteer centres, we see the enormous contributions of volunteers, the tremendous benefits of volunteering. We also see the barriers to volunteering, the challenges charities and not-for-profit organizations are facing, and the evolving dynamics between our sector and government. So, though Volunteer Canada is particularly interested in advancing recommendations that speak directly to volunteering, we continue to join our colleagues, leaders in the sector, to ensure that organizations where people volunteer are thriving. And so with that, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Senator Ratna Omidvar, um, who has just done an exceptional job along with her colleagues, not only in producing report, but the commitment to make sure it has legs and comes alive. Thank you so much. And over to you. Uh, thank you, Paula. And thank you to all the organizers, Charity Village, Volunteer Canada, the Volunteer Management Professionals of Canada for organizing this event. I am uh, at a time in my life on this report that I will accept every opportunity to speak about it and to make the case for action. And I welcome this opportunity to speak to all the people who are listening in. Um, so as you may or may not know, the, this was the first ever Senate study conducted on Canada's charitable and not-for-profit sector. And I think that in itself is a telling observation given the benign neglect of it in certain parts of Canada and as, as compared to the vital importance of the sector and its impact on almost every aspect of our lives as Canadians. We have, we know, uh, I think we can move on to the next slide. Um, as we all know, there are close to 170,000 charities and not-for-profits uh, in Canada. They contribute over $150 billion to our national economy every year. They represent 8.1% uh, of our GDP. Two million people are employed in this sector. And Approximately 2 billion volunteers are, hours are, are uh, expended by well-meaning volunteers spread across the, across the country. And yet, the sector is also facing an unprecedented cr crisis. We called it, in our report, a slowly intensifying crisis. Even as the demand for the work increases, its revenue streams are not able to keep up with its requirements. And imagine Canada has estimated that the sector will require at least an, an additional $25 billion in revenue by 2026, or else it will face, we will face a growing social deficit. So as essential as the sector is to our daily lives in many ways, from health and education to environment and sports, we seem to ignore it 
blithely accepting an uncharted future for it. And I say uncharted advisedly because there is an absence of reliable data and evidence to guide the future. We know, I think we all know intrinsically and intuitively, how trusted the sector is by Canadians, but we have been unable, the sector has been unable to translate that trust into respect. As a result, we, have an, we are faced with an Elizabethan era version of the definition of charity, an income tax act that has not been reviewed for 20 years, a patchwork of regulations that have been developed incrementally and focusing on niche issues. So we are so deep into the trees that we would not be able to see the forest even if it was before us. These are some of the reasons why the Senate approved the creation of a special committee on the sector. And I should tell the audience that special committees are approved most grudgingly by senators. So we, are, we were a seven-member committee led by Senator Terry Mercer of Nova Scotia. And Senator Mercer has to be commended for his advocacy and his efforts to get the committee approved. It is also important to note, I think, that Senator, both Senator Mercer and I have deep roots in the sector. Both Senator Mercer and I worked in the sector, so we bring this real lived experience, uh, we brought the experience to the task at hand. And our, our work focused on the, the meaningful ways the federal government, and only the federal government, could sustain, strengthen, and collaborate with the sector. We had one year, and it sounds like a long time, but trust me, friends, it was not. Uh, given the breadth, scale, and complexity of the sector, we have to be efficient with our time. So we created, uh, for the first time ever uh, in the Senate, I think we can go on to the next slide, um, we created, for the first time ever, an online survey, which 700 organizations uh, filled out, and therefore we were able to hear from uh, Canadians across the country. Uh, we also held 24 meetings. We heard from 160 academics, volunteers, and practitioners. We received 90 briefs. I think we talked to as many people as we, as we could uh, to advance our understanding. So in June 2019, we unveiled uh, the report. The report has 42 recommendations in it. Uh, but I'm not going to be able to go through all the recommendations. Instead, I'm going to try and speak to what I say are the, are the, are the tranches that build the foundation for moving forward. I remember when we held our first consultation as vice chair, I get the privilege of, of always asking the first question. And my first question was to the expert, how do we, how, how do we, how do we organize our work? How do we get our heads around a sector that is so large, so diverse, covering you know, uh, interests and activities ranging from sport to religion, from international aid to domestic issues? It's also a sector we know that is divided by size, and size in the sector seems to matter a great deal. On the one hand, there are large charities like hospitals, museums, and uh, universities. They have their own interests. And yet we know that the largest number of organizations have one, two, or no staff. So their interests are, are very different. So we decided to uh, pursue our work based on these tranches. And the first tranche was the people in the sector, the staff, volunteers, and the directors. The second was the money understanding how the money works, the giving trends, demographics, big organizations, small organizations. The third tranche was uh, the data on the information that we have as opposed to the data information that we need to advance our understanding of solutions. Fourth, the sector's relationship uh, with the whole of government, and by the whole of government, I don't mean the CRA, I mean the whole of government because the sector intersects with this work with various departments and institutions. Fifth, the Income Tax Act, uh, what's in it, what should be in it, 
and of course the CRA and its role in monitoring and uh, enforcing regulations. And finally, we took a look at the not-for-profit sector as well. Um, as we were doing this, I want to assure everybody that we did not reinvent the wheel completely. There have been two important studies that touch on our work. One is the Blue Ribbon, uh, ta the Blue Ribbon Task Force on Grants and Contributions, and the second is the Voluntary Sector Initiative. We pulled out the work, dusted it off the shelf, heard from expert witnesses who were involved in these issues so that we could benefit from their wisdom. So now we come to recommendations, and I am now speaking to the right slide. Thank you very much. So the people in the sector are, of course, the glue that holds it together. I think we all know, without the people, without people, nothing moves. Uh, so starting with volunteers, I'm going to switch it around because a lot of the people on the call are volunteers. We know that volunteers, you know, actually make everything work, uh, from essential services on the ground, delivering meals to uh, seniors, to managing the crowds at the Toronto International Film Festival, to helping address the needs of prisoners. But we also know that whilst many Canadians volunteer formally, there are many others, especially young people, who engage in informal volunteering. And how do we, how do we bring all of them into, into the big tent? And, and to this end, to, uh, to strengthen the landscape of volunteering, we called on the federal government to conceive of and implement a national volunteerism strategy. This is in part built on the model that was provided to us by Quebec. It would respond to new aid challenges of recruiting and retaining volunteers. It recognizes that uh, recruiting, managing, training volunteers has cost implications. So we asked the federal government to have a line item in every grant and contribution agreement that would recognize this cost. We heard about the barriers in terms of cost of volunteering, in particular the criminal checks, and we made a recommendation to the federal government to work with provincial counterparts and the chiefs of police to find ways of addressing this barrier. We did, however, reject calls, and there were quite a few of them, calls to compensate vol volunteers for out-of-pocket expenses uh, or to give them a tax credit for various reasons. But I remember uh, the, most Im the most compelling reason was, again, the added burden on organizations and individuals that this would have entailed, checking, validating, confirming, and, and also a basic... Uh, a philosophy that that volunteering uh, comes from um, and volunteering comes from people's desire uh, to do good work and somehow should not be put on a financial footing. I look forward to questions on that. We also took a very hard look at the staff who work in the se in, in the sector, and I came away with an abiding realization that the very people who we rely on to address the needs of poor people who live in precarious situations are themselves in a context of precarity because they live from contract to contract and they live from contract to contract because the government appears to give grants in you know contract to contract and post grants etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's no certainty in the in the environment we therefore recommended Oh, let me let me say something else. We also know that there's a huge wave of retirement facing the professionals in the sector, and we know that it is very, very hard, if not impossible, and I say this from experience, to recruit young people who think outside the box, who are digitally connected, who are familiar with concepts and rewards of disruption. It's very hard, and, and these young people often have a have a really visceral attachment to the mission of organizations, but it's very hard to recruit them and retain them because the sector is not competitive with the private sector. So putting all these trends together, we thought that the government should actually um, uh, develop a human resources plan, uh, sort of a back-end capacity builder, because most organizations do not have HR uh, uh, managers or even a slice of a person doing HR, it's come as you can kind of stuff. 
I know that from experience. You meet someone, you hire the first person who comes before your eyes because that's the nature of the work. We think a human resources uh, 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 institute, if I may call it that, would be a very useful um, uh, support for the sector. Um, th think of it as a think and do tank. We also called on the government to provide more sustainable grants um, uh, to the sector and persuaded as best as we could the government to acknowledge that overhead administrative costs are real costs and the sector cannot run without administrative and overhead costs. And these are not dirty words, but real, real necessary foundations to the building block blocks of organizations. We came across an excellent good idea from uh, Australia. Uh, Australia has is a very similar jurisdiction to ours. Uh, it has three levels of government and NGOs, and they got together in Australia and, and, and agreed on a chart of accounts which with vocabulary and definitions that everybody could find. So when you spoke about rent, you were all speaking about the same concept or about salaries or about contracts. So this is a small idea, but it could be one that could uh, incrementally support the sector. In terms of people, um, we also looked at the governance of the sector, and I was personally not surprised because I've worked in this issue before. I was not surprised to hear that uh, the commitment to diversity in the governance uh, arena of the not-for-profit and charitable sector remains largely aspirational. And in order to move it from the aspirational to the practical, we made the recommendation that uh, not-for-profit or charities should uh, provide on their T3010 uh, information about the demographics of their governance as per the employment equity legislation, because you need to know what your baseline is before you need to, before you plan to go forward. Next, we'll get to the money. The money is obviously really important. And there are three uh, revenue streams, largely put, for the sector. One is, of course, federal, and slide should say, grants from government, because the sector does, does get grants from federal, provincial, and local government. Then there are charitable donations, which we know are a, are, are a sizable amount. And Canadians are generally considered to be very, very generous. And then there's earned revenue, which, earned revenue, which is uh, the capacity for not-for-profit, for charities, let me say, uh, to earn revenue from related business activities. So we made a recommendation uh, to uh, each on each of these points. On federal grants, we observed with interest uh, that um, Canadian charities and not-for-profits do not have access to a range of federal support that the for-profit sector, for instance, has. There are programs and initiatives that the for-profit sector can tap in in terms of marketing, technology, innovation, and surprisingly enough, overhead and administrative costs are a recognized feature in these initiatives. So we ask on the federal government to level the playing field and to make these uh, initiatives also available uh, to the not-for-profit and charitable sector. On charitable donations, we noted that Canadians are generous people, but we also noted that even though the generosity, the absolute generosity of Canadians continues to rise, the absolute numbers of people who are giving has dropped. So smaller numbers of people giving larger amounts of money. Younger Canadians are far more issues driven. They are not necessarily motivated by the tax credit that they may get. They're also not motivated by institutions. They're more motivated by causes. So they're more likely to fund a GoFundMe campaign as opposed to an organization. And this is a serious trend, and we called on the Permanent Advisory Committee of the, uh, that the minister has appointed to the Canadian Revenue Agency to grapple a little bit more of this and come to recommendations on how to incent both big donors and current donors and new donors to step up to the plate. And finally, to earn revenue, 
And I, may, I, I want everyone uh, to uh, appreciate the fact that this is the only source of income that is growing. So this should be viewed with some seriousness by the sector. Charities are able to earn revenue from related business activities, but they have to frankly turn themselves into pretzels of all kind. And we heard some pretty compelling um, witness statements from one of the Kielberger brothers um, and Miru V. And the, the costs related with setting up sister organizations that are not-for-profits or foundations or B corporations or whatever it is. And it, it, it's really hard uh, for, for not-for-profit organizations and charities to do this. The current law is outmoded. It is located in a time when charities ran gift shops and did, you know, bingo drives or whatever, but incompatible at a time when some charities may find themselves in the position of generating revenue as landlords. My personal view is that we should focus on the destination of funds as opposed to the means of, of generating the funds. So as long as a charity proves that they are using the revenue to fund their charitable causes, I'm okay with that. But there are tensions. These tensions are around unfair competition with the business sector, a fear that charities will get so enamored of running a business that they will lose sight of their vision, et cetera, et cetera. So we made a cautious recommendation to the CRA to conduct a pilot experiment. The next essential set of recommendations, and I need to hurry up uh, because there's so much more, is around evidence, and I think you will all appreciate this. So all I'm going to say is that we need predictable, reliable evidence. Um, there are only two sources of evidence on the sector. One is StatsCan, the other is the T3010 form, and together they should give us a robust picture. Sadly, that is not the case because, as you all know, studies that were started in 2010 were stopped, and now we are restarting again. Um, and as one very compelling witness told us on any given day, it is uh, we, Canadians know how many eggs are laid in Canada, but we do not know how many people work in the sector. And this has to change. So the satellite account of for not for profit institutions vol and volunteering, which conducted its uh, first ever analysis in 2010, it's now being published again in 2019, nine years after, that is not acceptable. We need to have these studies done reliably within natural intervals, definitely not nine years. The other uh, 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 field of information is obviously the t 30 tens that every charity fills out, and questions have been asked as to whether we should enhance the questions, we should ask more questions, of the sector in this form, meld and merge them with what we know from Stats Canada. At the same time, we also heard from organizations that the T3010 was a brutal uh, document to fill out and it wasn't fair that organizations that generated $5,000 in charitable donations should have to fill out the same 30-page form as, 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 as organizations that received $300 million. So we, had, we were sensitive to that. But we, we did flag these concerns to the CRA Advisory Committee. The next set of recommendations I would suggest, they are titled Relationships. I would say that these three recommendations are probably, for me, the most important recommendations because they will truly transform uh, uh, the sector. And the first is responding to what we heard from the sector, that the sector needs a home within the government. And the sector was not talking about the CRA, which is a monitor, a monitor and enforcer. The sector needs an enabler. And we heard lots of ideas. We need a minister, we need uh, you know, the governor general as the ambassador, et cetera, et cetera. And we made a recommendation that we hope will stick and we embedded it within government. Because the sector has expertise, knowledge, customer relationships, analysis, perspectives on legislation you know, ranging from cannabis to assisted suicide. And they go, these, these perspectives are far more important to the government 
than simply to the CRA. So we recommend, yes, we agree the sector needs a champion, but we also want this champion to connect the sector to all the other levers within the government. And we therefore arrived at the Ministry of Science, Innovation and Development, because the sector is so much about science, innovation and development. We recommend that it should be embedded within the machinery of government, that it should have a senior level ADM attached to it, and that this, this department should issue an annual report on the sector every year. We also were, I mean, I was personally appalled because we would review legislation every five years on a bunch of other issues, but the Income Tax Act, uh, is the charity section of the Income Tax Act has not been reviewed for 20 years. So we say review this every five years because things are moving at such a fast pace. We need to take, keep up with changes, especially in technology and, and demographics. There were a bunch of other things around the Income Tax Act that we heard. I don't think I can go into the frustrations around uh, charitable purposes versus charitable activities uh, or between the different dif differences between public foundations, private foundations, and charitable organizations. So I'm going to gloss over them and move to the third bullet, which is moving appeals of CRA decisions to the federal tax court as opposed to uh, the federal court of appeals. We recommend that these appeals, and these appeals happen when an organization is, that charitable status is revoked or denied, be heard by the tax court for a number of reasons. First, our legal system is founded on the premise of common law, and it is essential uh, that decisions be made that evolve the common law. But the court of appeals is slow, it is cumbersome, it is extremely expensive, with appeals costing over $50,000, it is no wonder that very few charities now take the recourse of appealing a decision of the, of the CRA. When they don't appeal, and when the appeals are so costly, that is why they don't appeal, it also stops the evolution of common law. And we need the common law to evolve because as we know, our law of charity is harks back to Elizabethan times. So a nimble practical and we think incredibly sensible way of dealing with it is to let the tax court hear these appeals. After all, it is the tax court that hears appeals of Canadians on tax matters, hears the appeals of corporations on tax matters. It should be the court to hear the appeals on charitable matters as well. And my understanding is that whilst it would take a little time, it's not incredibly cumbersome or expensive to do so. We also recommend it that the federal government should have a, a, a litigation fund that would support access to the federal tax code of appeals for smaller charities. Next, we come to the CRA. I'm going to ask, uh, yes, the CRA. Um, the CRA is, of course, the critical agency at this point when it comes to monitoring uh, the, the sector. And we want to commend the CRA on um, the improvements it has undertaken um, on more timely communications. It has taken on an incredibly important initiative called Roadshows that travels across the country uh, to help organizations understand charity law and how to stay within the law. At the same time, we also heard that the agency is not quite respon responsive enough and wait times are long. So, of course, we called on the CRA yet once again to reduce waiting time. On a few important matters, they were very compelling. We came to the conclusion that we should ask the CRA to test a few ideas before changing the regulations, and I'll very briefly go over them. Uh, so, first, the unrelated business activities. That's a really important point because of the source of revenue. We think that the CRA should experiment in a small pilot, giving certain organizations the capacity to run businesses 
uh, on unrelated business activities as long as the revenue was uh, was devoted to charitable. So we need a pilot project on that. We also heard lots of complaints from organizations who say, we cannot partner with not-for-profit organizations because we and charities can only give money to other charities. They can't you know, hand over money to another organization. This is the qualified donees. And so we asked on the, C the CRA uh, to expand the giving circle to non-qualified donees under certain limited circumstances and to make an assessment whether this pathway should be expanded. Uh, we heard a great deal uh, from big donors uh, primarily to examine the, to look at uh, exemption of uh, the donation donations of private shares and real estate from capital gains tax when such securities or real estate uh, properties are donated to charities. Uh, there was conflicting uh, uh, evidence on this. So again, a thoughtful way forward would be to ask the CRA to conduct a small pilot project. We didn't hesitate, though, on, on something I hope that will interest you all, and that is uh, how the CRA should deal with charities who operate overseas. Currently, the regulations are very tight. Uh, there is an expenditure control or an expenditure responsibility test that really uh, uh, forces international charities uh, who are best served by working with local projects overseas. And, and the only way I can describe this, and I'm using the words of a witness, is we deal with local charities in a way that smacks of colonialism. Uh, we tell them exactly what to do, exactly, and, and they felt actually oppressed by this, and they asked for some relief from this. So we made a recommendation that um, uh, the CRA should move away from the direction and control mentality to an expenditure control mentality. mentality. And I hope that was clear, but if not, we can, we can talk about it. Uh, the CRA Permanent Advisory Council is a very welcome innovation into the space. And I'm delighted that all the members of the council have been named and that all the members of the council are well-known sectors well-known, respected sector leaders. If I was a member of the Advisory Council, I would sift through this report and pick out all the advice we gave to them. And just in case anyone is listening, any one of them is listening in, or you feel you, can, you want to communicate to them, our, our report actually has a bit of a road, road map for them. We made a number of significant recommendations that I will quickly go through because our time is tight. We asked the, the Advisory Council uh, to consider whether the disbursement quota for registered charities should be contained in regulation rather than in the law. Every time you change the law, there's, there's a lot of work involved, consultations, legislation, committee work, etc. And I, I, I talk about this because in uh, 2008, the disbursement quota was dropped uh, from 4.5% to 3.5%. And this because uh, we were in uh, a recession. Well, the recession has long passed, but the disbursement quota has not risen again from 3.5% to something else. And I know that many charitable foundations do more than 3.5%. I know that. But I also know that others don't. Uh, so I think it is important for the Advisory Council to take a look at the disbursement quota, but more importantly, not on its absolute percentage figure, but to consider whether this should be in regulation and therefore can be moved up and down in a far more nimble way. Um, we think that the CRA Advisory Committee should obviously review measures that will incentivize donations. Um, we think it should look at the T-3010 and the T-1044 forms. They, these are the forms filled out annually by charities and not-for-profits. 
and and determine whether um, we should ask more questions, whether we should ask fewer questions, whether we should set, we should have different questionnaires for different size organizations. That actually appeals to me a great deal. But again, this is something for the advisory council to look at. Uh, we we think it's important for the advisory council to take a look at how the sector does or does not, and it is pra primarily the second. It does it does not have access to capital, startup capital, etc. It's very hard to come come by. Um, we were persuaded that the statutory definition of charity, which can evolve by common law, and so we think better by appeals going to the tax court. But there is another way of doing it which is to have a new definition of charity. And there are pros and cons, you know, Australia has got a new definition of charity instead of four heads of charity, they have 15 heads of charity. Now, I'm not sure it's too much, too little, but again, this is something we ask the advisory council to take a look at, and so on and so forth. Um, I will spend a little bit of time on a final recommendation to the CRA Permanent Advisory Council on donor advised funds. Donor advised funds are the single largest instrument that is growing more rapidly than any other charitable instrument. And they are, they do fantastic work, raise a lot of money, but there are concerns that the money sits in the fund, the donor advised fund, as opposed to being dispersed out to charities. Um, and again, this is, um, this is a concern because even though uh, one organization such as, you know, think of a community foundation, in its overall reporting, it can declare that it dispersed the 3.5% that it is legally required to do. That amount, that, that is an aggregate figure and does not pertain to individual donor advised funds. So we think this is a really big issue. There's lots of money uh, in this instrument. It needs to be released and deployed to the best benefit of charitable organizations, which is why they were set up. And finally, uh, we looked, we, we took a look at the not-for-profit sector, which is uh, distinct from the, for, from the charitable sector uh, because it does not have uh, the capacity to, to issue receipts. It, uh, its, its budgets are sometimes smaller, sometimes much larger. In general, we felt that not-for-profits should be required to be more transparent, and there is a simple instrument. They file a two-page T1044. We think this should be made public. We also think that the government should take a look at distinguishing between those not-for-profits that are member benefits you could argue that the CAA, the Canadian Automobile Association, is a member benefit organization, or whether it is a public benefit organization. And we know, we know lots of not-for-profits that are public benefit, and one could argue both sides, which is that, that you know, they are both. But there are, I mean, you know, we, we know that there are associations of people who come together and form a not-for-profit uh, you know, uh, I heard about the Car Sales Men's Association of Ajax. I would suggest that that's probably a private member benefit than a public benefit. We need to have some discussion on this. Condo boards are private benefits, not for profits, for instance. So finally, um, I want to make some concluding comments before opening it up to your questions. I've had, I, you know, I, I'm very, very pleased with the report. It covers, as you can see, A to Z, north to south, east to west of the sector. I am disappointed, however, that we were not able to speak uh, or have witness testimony from provincial governments. Um, and that is interesting because technically charities are with, fall within the jurisdiction of provincial governments, but I think the provincial governments because of the overriding presence of the CRA and the charitable donations issue, the, the provincial government seemed to have de facto um, ceded the space to the federal government. It would have been very good to speak to provincial governments. And I would encourage those of you with connections in provincial governments to get the response of the provincial government uh, to this report. 
My biggest disappointment, though, has been uh, the complete lack of media interest on our, in our report. And perhaps I shouldn't be disappointed. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, there are no um, journalists who are assigned specifically to the third sector, which is why I personally would have called, but I'm just one member of the committee, uh, and everything has to be decided as a whole. I would have personally liked to have had a standing committee in the House and in the Senate on the third sector that would have given us the kind of added respect that we need, but maybe that's for the future. Right now, we have an issue in that uh, Canadians are not talking about this report. I think we should go to the next slide because I'm done with this, this one. Yes, we've, uh, we've uh, uh, published an open letter and I'm Delighted to tell you that many sector organizations have signed on to it. Uh, we, we are using a hashtag, vote charitably, and by which we mean when, you, when candidates come to your door, when you go to town halls, when your organization is hosting a local candidate, ask them the questions. Ask them, you know, I'm, I like the number five. Develop five questions, you can ask them. My, my worry is about general aspirational questions. And let me play out the script. A candidate will come to your town hall and you will ask the candidate, uh, what do you think is the role of the charitable and voluntary sector in Canada? You're going to get a motherhood and apple pie response. You have to get specific. So the specific question could be, will you implement, will you work on promoting the development of a national volunteerism strategy? Those are specifics. The specific questions can be taken from the report. You may have others, but I urge each and every one of you to make it the issue for the sector in this coming election. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop now and, and take questions if, from you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think many people are smiling, nodding, and um, what you've said um, is music to our ears. So, questions. This is great. Um, thank you both to you, the Senator, and thanks, Paula, for jumping in. As you say, lots of nodding <laughs> going on. We're getting some wonderful comments and um, a lot of uh, great comments on Twitter as well. So thanks to those of you that are joining in there. Um, I'd like to jump in first and foremost with a question about uh, what happens to the committee's report once it has been submitted to the Senate. It was tabled in the Senate on the last day of our sitting. We have to do that and get that tabled. Otherwise, all the work would have been, in parliamentary terms, washed away. Uh, so the report has been tabled. It has not been spoken to. When we sit again, my understanding is that it will get spoken to and debated. And once uh, all the procedural stuff has been dealt with in the Senate, a letter will go to all the relevant ministers and to the government departments asking them for a response, and then we will get a written response. That's the time. Uh, interested people will go and see ministers, will go and see deputy ministers, and start pushing certain recommendations uh, that may interest them more than others. But by that time, we will have a new government. And so I'm going to ask everyone to socialize and animate the recommendations in the report as part of an election platform uh, for all of you because you know better than I do uh, that the actions of government, the policies, the regulations, the statutes impact on your work. So um, I would say as much as it's in the Senate's hand or MP's hand, I think it's in your hand. And that is a wonderful lead-in to uh, something that I know Paula and Ruth had, had also um, brought forward, which was we wanted to ask you as attendees, what ideas do you have to promote awareness of the report? And we'd, we'd love to hear your comments. So um, if you have suggestions or ideas, please pop them in the, in the chat box or uh, let us know on Twitter because uh, this, this really is a, a report that needs to be um, you know, promoted and signed on to by the sector as well. So 
Um, that's great. Now, uh, we had quite a few questions coming in, um, perhaps not surprisingly, around the recommendations regarding employment. Um, so, yes. So first of all, um, do the recommendations address um, the nature of precarious contract employment in the sector? We don't per se make recommendations about the contract nature of the of, of employment in the sector we do say that the federal government's contracts grants and contributions should be two years long we we make that point we also call on the federal government to uh, facilitate the creation of portable pension products so that an employee has a pension with organization A after three years moves to organization B that that pension go with them. And I think um, the, the, the calling into life of a human resources, uh, uh, human capital renewal institute, and we all know that this existed. Uh, it was one of the legacies of the voluntary sector initiative that there was a human resources council. We chose not to use that word, that terminology for, for, for good reason, but something in that nature needs to exist again uh, to be the go-to place, uh, both on employment trends in the sector, employment issues and needs in the sector, as well as uh, providing real life support to organizations looking to meet the HR needs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, on a similar note, uh, as you mentioned in your presentation, um, it's very hard for our sector to compete with the private sector, especially in terms of wages. Um, so do, do the recommendations address this difficulty of recruiting and retaining top talent? We do, uh, by calling into life this human resources secretariat for the sector. I'm, I'm using terminology that, that may not be exactly reflective of the ter terminology in the report. If you have a sector-wide capacity that can encourage um, different ways of, uh, of tapping into talent, of working with the private sector, I mean, these are all things that, is, that uh, a, a federal institution that is mandated to look at the HR needs of the sector could do. So I think it's important to call on the government to launch this sooner rather than later because the employment needs of the sector, in my view, are, are dominant at this point with the wave of retirements, with technology, with demographics. We need the right people in the jobs at the right time as opposed to just another warm body. Absolutely. I, I think there's probably a lot of heads nodding in a lot of offices across Canada listening into this. Um, I want to pause for a moment on uh, questions and uh, just wanted to turn it over maybe to Paula and Ruth. Did, did you both have some final comments you'd, you'd maybe like to take a few minutes for? Ruth, why don't you go ahead? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, Senator, thank you so much for um, the in-depth uh, report that you've given in the last 30 minutes or so, um, given lots of highlights of it. I would um, encourage people as whether you're um, a volunteer manager or whether you're an executive director or are the many people on the call to really go and look at that report and really figure out um, what does it mean to you but also, um, there's a couple of slides as, as in the slide deck that we don't need to go to right now, but, uh, but really figure out what it is, what does it mean to you, talk to your coworkers, talk to your networks, spread the word, like the Senator said, there's not an awful lot of uptake, and we're responsible, it's our report to own and to make a difference and to move us forward and to make that difference moving us forward. Paula? Well, thank you. And again, thank you, Senator, for the wonderful overview and to Charity Village and also to the Volunteer Management Professionals of Canada. And I know you have members across the country who do amazing work in engaging volunteers. Um, for Volunteer Canada, this is timely for many reasons and many of the 
um, identi things I identified in the report about the changes in the sector and the changing nature of how people are giving, um, we really see the opportunity to develop um, a national strategy on volunteering as an exciting one because, as everybody knows, um, we're not only talking about the services that volunteers provide, but what does it mean for people who get engaged in communities from different ages, um, and different sectors. We know businesses are encouraging employees to give educational institutions and that volunteering and a national strategy not only can be taken from an inclusion point of view, but how do we as individuals shape the communities that we live in um, in a way that reflects our values. So a lot of very exciting things and, and very important things to the work that we all do. So um, I just wanted to thank all those involved. Imagine Canada has been doing some work convening some leaders to further understand the report and to think about how various leadership organizations can be mapped against the, the various recommendations in terms of moving forward. So I encourage people to um, connect with Imagine Canada around that. And um, again, Volunteer Canada is very committed to working with the sector and other leaders and governments to really move forward, promote the report, and be involved in the recommendations. That's fantastic, Paula. Um, thank you for mentioning that um, Imagine Canada initiative as well. I am going to attempt here to put that into the, the chat box for everyone also. Um, some great comments <laughs> just about how much is in this report. And uh, I know uh, one of our attendees mentioned, you know, this is really going to take a little bit of time for them to digest and uh, really appreciated having the senator here today to kind of break it down a little bit uh, for them. So so um, that's great, and I'm sure there's a lot of folks that feel the same way. Um, we had another comment uh, from an organization that has committed to sharing the report uh, with their chapters, their local chapters, uh, through their newsletter and, and talking with their uh, local chapter governance as well. So I think that's a great thing for folks to think about also. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, please go ahead. Great. Okay. Um, I have one final question, um, just moving off of the HR side of things um, and into fundraising. Are there any specific recommendations for increasing the donor base? And I'm sure that's a question that um, is probably on a lot of folks' mind. Uh, do you mean increasing the numbers of people who give as opposed to absolute dollar amounts? We, yes. I, I was very... You know, I, I've worked my entire life in uh, small small charities or mid-sized charities before I went over to the private foundation field. And even then, the private foundation was a relatively small private foundation. Um, and I, I was disappointed that we didn't come to a muscular recommendation on how do you encourage more Canadians to give. And I know that the CRA, at the recommendation of Imagine Canada a few years ago, launched the stretch tax credit, which, which allowed Canadians to donate over a period of years to qualify for the charitable donation, which has a minimum amount. Um, there was very little uptake on that pilot. Um, and, and I'm still not sure where that whether that uptake on the pilot was due to the lack of outreach and advertisement or just that pe it, 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 it didn't stick. So I don't know. I, I do know that one of the biggest issues that charities have to face is, is uh, tapping into uh, the desire of Canadians to be connected to an issue as opposed to the organization. And I know this is hard for many charities and not-for-profits to hear, um, but issue-based campaigns seem to generate a lot of money. So I, 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 you know, I'm, this is not in the recommendation, this is a recommendation to you, you know, find an issue, an individual, a story, and then put it out and, and, and hopefully the donations will come. We did get a lot of pressure on, um, on the uh, donation of uh, real estate and privately held securities, but we are also mindful of the fact uh, 
that every dollar that is that is um, charitably receded by the organization and therefore qualifies for a tax deduction uh, is um, has an impact on the revenue of the government. Uh, and, and then the question of balance arises. Uh, are philanthropists best able to take care of the many issues that beset Canadians? Or should it be the government, which is, which has a different mandate, which serves all Canadians as opposed to specific charities and specific populations? So these are really philosophical questions. And we wanted to be wise, but cautious. So we've made a series of recommendations to the advisory committee to say they, they should take a look at this in the fullness of time that they have and they didn't have to put forward some recommendations. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm cognizant of the fact that we're running up on time here. So I, I think we are going to um, call it a day. Um, did the three of you have any final comments before we sign off? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for your interest and look forward to what we can do together with Volunteer Canada, Volunteer Management Professionals of Canada, and all the other leadership organizations and all the folks across the country interested in moving forward with this. Thank, Thank you so you. much for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Wonderful. So on behalf of Charity Village, all of our attendees, I want to thank Senator Omidvar, uh, Paula Spivak, Reese Millard for such a wonderful introduction to the report. It's been a great session. We really appreciate all of you taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I do just want to remind everyone that we are going to follow up with you by email this afternoon or by tomorrow morning at the latest with the webinar recording and the slide deck. I would suggest that one of the things that um, everyone can do is uh, share this webinar as an introduction, share it with your networks. It's publicly available. So um, please, let's keep the momentum going. There will also be a short survey that uh, will take less than five minutes for you to fill out. I hope that you'll complete that for us if you can. There is an opportunity there to let us know if there's future topics you'd like to see us cover in upcoming sessions. We'll also be sure, uh, sure to share the feedback with panelists as well. Our next free webinar is coming up on October 10th. We're going to be discussing practical tips to get started with digital transformation and hopefully free up some valuable time in your workday. Uh, there will be a link to register in the email that you receive later today or tomorrow. Thank you again, uh, all of you, for joining us today, and I hope we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.